Welcome. Welcome to this evening's final Wildlife in the Red lecture. And we are delighted to welcome Jen Crisford here from the National Trust. Thank you very much for being here, Jen, this evening. So coming to Jen, thank you so much, Jen, for being here tonight. Jen will talk about an exciting partnership project looking carefully at how they are introducing the reintroduction of beavers to the wild in Purbeck. And this is amazing because I literally live on the edge of Purbeck in Dorset, so I'm very excited to hear this. She's going to discuss the reasons behind this initiative as well as current progress that's being made on the project and how you can get involved. So I'm really excited to hear about that, that citizen science element. Jane Crisford works as an engagement officer for the National Trust uh, on the Perbic Beaver project. Um, she's originally from Dorset, um, but she actually began her wildlife career in Malawi, where she managed a wildlife reserve. Um, she worked on the re-release of a variety of different species, and she worked with communities to build awareness about how to reduce human and wildlife conflict. Fascinating stuff, Jen. I would love to explore that later with you in the questions and find out more about your background. So it's over to you. Thank you ever so much for being here. We are delighted to welcome you to Wessex Museum's Wildlife in the Red. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Um, I will go straight to sharing my screen. Um, just to say um, that while I am an engagement officer, I also work with a lot of other people on this project both within the National Trust and also a lot of external partners and experts and scientists as well. And so I will do my very best to answer all your questions today. And if I can't answer them all, I will refer them to my colleagues. So let me share my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. So I'm going to begin the talk today with some beaver basics. Um, some of you may be very well informed about beavers and for some of you this might be your first experience with them. So we'll start at the very beginning. You can get to the next slide. There seems to be a little bit of a delay on the slide so we'll see how we get on. Um, so Beavers are a rodent. They're the second largest rodent in the world after the capybara. And they tend to be around, adults tend to be around 18 to 20 kilograms. And they can range up to a size of around 35 kilograms. So they're quite a big animal. And that does surprise people um, if they're seeing them for the first time. In order to explain to you the kind of size that we're talking about, that's roughly in line with a spaniel or up to the size of a, a fairly big Labrador. So when they're older, um, they can reach those kinds of sizes and that's not uncommon. There's two types of uh, two species of beavers surviving today. Um, one is based in North America. So you'll find that the USA and in Canada. And the other is the Eurasian beaver, which is the species that we're going to be talking about today. And the native range for Eurasian beavers stretches all the way across Europe and even into parts of Asia as well. So they're a nocturnal species and they're very well adapted to the freshwater habitats that they inhibit. Um, they have lots of adaptations, which we will cover in a moment, but this is the place that they feel safe. So they will try and stay in the water as much as possible. They're not very agile on dry land, but they're very mobile in the water. And this is where they feel safe from predators and the predators that used to be here in the past. So they will stay in the water as much as they can. I think the, the common cartoon idea that we've all been fed about beavers is that they live in very large rivers, they build extremely big dams and they stop the water flat like this cartoon here, but as a matter of fact they can live in any habitat where there is fresh water and there's food available for them to eat, so that can be larger rivers, smaller streams, ponds, lakes and even ditches, um, these are all suitable habitats for beavers to live in. So they're very well known for their damming capabilities and beavers will build dams out of um, whatever's available really so that will be sticks and um, sometimes stones and, and larger boulders and also mud and that will pack into to the gaps. 
The reasons why they do this, um, if you look at the diagram at the bottom of the page here, is to raise the water level behind the dam. So they don't need to do this in every situation. If they find themselves in a scenario where the water is deep enough for them to easily swim around already, that might be 70 centimetres or so, um, then they don't need to create any dams at all. And so this is something that you'll only see in situations where they want to make the water um, either deeper or slow it down and make it a more stable environment for them. They will also um, use it sometimes to spread water out so that the water is closer to a food source and they'll dig channels sideways from the river to get closer to the food as well. So beavers live in underground burrows. Um, you can also see that on the diagram. They will burrow up from under the water into the river bank or pond bank so that the entrance is under the water and the chamber where they can uh, sleep and have their kits um, is above the water line so it's nice and dry and cozy inside. So if you've got river banks with a steeper topography then this is perfectly possible without any help and you won't see anything at all because the entrance will be under the water safe from potential predators to get inside. If it's a flatter area, then beavers will construct their own riverbank, um, known as a lodge, out of, again, um, sticks and mud. And this will provide that roof or upper level for their sleeping chambers um, so that they have somewhere safe to stay. So contrary to popular belief, a beaver is completely herbivorous. And the, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe and, uh, and other stories like this have potentially led some of us astray in our beliefs about that. It also commonly confused with otters, which do eat uh, fish, but beavers will eat vegetation and that will be a huge variety of um, different plants, whether it's grasses, leaves, shrubs, herbs, um, or even the bark from, from branches. And so, they very much like native tree species and the leaves of these. And willow is their absolute favorite food. So if you look at this table, you'll see lots of different native tree species, but willow is a clear favorite. Um, I have been told by some of my colleagues who have beavers already that uh, there is also personal preferences with diet between beavers. So some may show obvious signs of liking um, alder and some may not like the alder at all but really like um, apple trees, for example. So you can have a bit of variety there between individuals too. But all of these native tree species are um, co-evolved with beavers. Beavers are native to England and is co being gnawed by beavers. So if you coppice a tree, um, you'll see that it quickly regrows uh, with young shoots from the, the cut branches. And this is what you'll see with beavers, that there's rapid regrowth and lots of fresh younger shoots coming up and you get a more dynamic system with your trees. So these are some of the adaptations that I was mentioning towards their freshwater lifestyle. Um, so you've got the tail and webbed rear feet, which are very good for um, propelling them through the water and maneuvering underwater as well. On their faces, the, uh, their eyes, ears and nose are all set very high so that they're above the, the waterline when they're swimming around on the surface. And they have closable nostrils and ears as well. So they can close these and, and stop the water from getting in. They have transparent eye membranes which are like goggles so that they can see underwater and they even have skin flaps behind their teeth so that they can carry sticks underwater in their mouths without um, taking in that water so very uh, well adapted indeed they have very thick fur so it's actually got two layers um, very soft and dense layer underneath and a coarse layer on the top which they waterproof using um, the gland secretions that they make and they'll comb that through. They've got very dexterous front paws so they'll use these for eating, for, for turning the sticks over and um, when they're eating 
uh, sticks and things, you'll notice that their teeth are actually orange. So again, unlike the cartoons, um, because I'm so strong, with a softer dentine underneath, and that keeps them naturally sharpened because the softer dentine wears down more quickly and you end up with a sharp point. So it's very important to understand that beavers are native to the UK and to England. Um, this is a difference to non-native invasive species, which some people sometimes compare. When we're talking about a reintroduction, it's an animal that was here before that everything co-evolved with, and that is very different to introduce. So after the last ice age, you can see the um, spread of an estimated um, population range for, for Eurasian beavers. And this would have been hundreds of millions of animals across this, this area. But unfortunately, by the late 19th century, um, we managed to hunt that number down to around 1,200 animals, um, just in very small fragmented populations across mainland Europe. And this was because of hunting for the pelts, which was used um, in fashionable top hats and various other things, and also the grand secretions that I mentioned, um, which they use for territorial marking and such. Um, somebody discovered that this um, had a, a scent of vanilla, and so this was widely used in uh, perfumes. It also, because of the willow that they eat, has a similar um, component to aspirin and was a pain reliever as well. So this was widely used in medicine too. So these reasons uh, combined fish and therefore you could eat it during Lent um, meant that we managed to completely wipe them from English soils and made them extinct here. So from the 1930s, um, other countries in Europe started reintroduction programs. And this map from 2020 shows you um, the estimated range that we have now, which is largely thanks to those reintroductions. And since then, they have also been able to um, repopulate the, the areas and to spread, but without the help of those uh, reintroduction programs that probably wouldn't have happened. So within the UK, um, we started making some progress on this in around about 2000. And you will have seen in the papers and things, lots of enclosed projects popping up um, since then, especially in the last couple of years. So within England enclosures, because at the moment they do not have permission to be released in, officially into the wild. Um, in Scotland, they received native status again in 2019. And that was following some, um, also some enclosed projects, but some um, wild populations that were discovered on the River Tay as well. Um, our closest project to here is found in Devon. So that's the River Otter project. They discovered that they had beavers in 2010. And since then, a five-year trial was completed to show how uh, the communities there could manage and live with the beaver population and uh, that finished in 2020 and has been a big part of um, talking to our government here about the potential reintroduction of this species on a wider scale so at the moment there are a few wild populations dotted around and this has generally been um, through escapes or accidental situations uh, not from license releases so at the moment um, there are acknowledged wild populations in the river um, Tamar in Devon, the Stour in Kent, the Avon and Brew in Somerset and Wiltshire, the Little Dart in Devon, and uh, a population starting to form on the way in Herefordshire as well. So as we stand at the moment, the government are looking at the proposal to have wild releases allowed uh, within England, and I will cover that in a little bit more detail at the end of the talk. So in terms of dispersal, if you have a beaver population, um, they are a monogamous species and they will live in, in family groups with their litter of young. So they have one litter per year and that will be on average two to four kits. 
each year. So they breed quite slowly, end up with a family group um, with two generations of kits normally uh, living together uh, within one territory. When they reach two years old, they'll need to move out of the, the burrow to make space for the next generation that are coming along. And they'll need to look for their own territories. So while there remains um, available territories within the catchment that they're in, they will just um, populate one of those. And those territories can range from anything to half a kilometre up to 20 kilometres, depending on food availability. So if there's lots of food available, they don't need to defend such a big territory. When a catchment reaches capacity, though, um, they will need to look for alternatives in neighbouring catchments and for opportunities to reach those. Um, this will be limited by the, um, their ability to get to them. So over dry land, um, they might struggle to, to walk for long distances. And also by sea travel, that's quite challenging because they will die from salt toxicity if they spend too much time in salt water. And so um, there are natural population controls within the beavers uh, population themselves. They're, they're incredibly territorial animals, so they will kill each other um, quite easily with their, with their teeth. And uh, that happens quite readily when animals are looking for new homes. So one of the questions you may be asking yourself is why beavers? Why do we want to bring beavers back to, to these areas where they've been missing for quite some time? And essentially, from this moment throughout the talk, if you can think about why beavers in line with why wetlands, because um, one of the major reasons that we want to bring beavers back is um, the engineering that they do in order to create their homes essentially creates or recreates wetland habitats. And the reason why we need those so badly is that we have destroyed the ones that we had. So we've taken away around 90% of the UK's wetland habitats in just the last 100 years. So this has been a fairly drastic um, loss of habitat. And we've done that because we've drained that uh, very fertile land for, for land use by modifying the streams. Um, this very complex structure in the middle that you can see is what rivers used to and naturally should look like. And the straight channels that you may be more familiar with um, are all man-made modified streams, um, very channelized, uh, so they're deeper, so they don't, um, they're not able to spread naturally across the floodplain like they would have done in the past. So we have uh, recently acknowledged a, a lot of issues that we're facing um, with the poor status of climate, um, with the state of nature and the loss of lots of species facing a mass extinction and also issues of water quality. And we're not um, exempt from that here. We have lots of water quality issues facing Pearl Harbor um, with especially excess nutrients creating algae mats within the harbor, which is damaging the habitats there as well. And so there's lots of work going on to look at how we can start to resolve some of these issues. When we talk about beavers, we want to try to understand how we can work with them to help to uh, restore some of these natural habitats and rather than working against them. So I'm now gonna cover some of the benefits of restoring wetlands. So the first one I'm probably most obvious is um, the benefits for nature. There is a, a lot of things on this slide, but that's because there's a lot, a lot of benefits for nature by bringing back the species and, and the habitats that they create. So um, it's a very complex, dynamic and diverse habitat. By putting in a dam, um, you create deeper pools and variety of, of depths, which gives you different uh, water temperatures and maintains cool areas. Um, as we said, you're slowing and spreading the water so that that's able to soak into the soils. And a dam isn't a um, firm structure, so it is leaky and water will go through the dam, also around the edges of the dam and in heavier rainfall over the top of the dam as well. And what you end up with is a multi-channeled system, a bit like the, the image I just showed you a second ago. So 
you're also holding back the sediment um, behind the dam and that uh, is causing a lot of the issues we have with water quality. So below a dam, you'll have cleaner gravels and um, therefore um, more varied habitats as well. So the aquatic plants are able to, to come back. Um, more light is able to get in if you've got uh, trees felled here and there so that there's more light reaching the water and the possibility for lots more variety of, um, of plant species too. The invertebrates are drawn to, to these habitats and they in turn attract bats and birds. And the fallen and dead wood can also provide biomass and protection for um, fish, reptiles, amphibians, and um, it's therefore providing food and spawning habitats um, for these species as well. So you can see at just a glance uh, some of the nature benefits that you're getting from these complex wetland systems. Some of the activities that beavers do as well, if, if they're burrowing into the riverbanks, as we discussed, these can be reused by other species such as otters so they can benefit from that um, also there may be more fish in this area because they're benefiting from the biomass and otters eat fish and so that's good for them too um, and voles and shrews can also live in in the riverbanks so there's a lot more as a so if, um, a statistic for you is that 40% of all species need wetland habitats. And so you can imagine with the limited number that we have available to us now, why these species are struggling so much. So beavers are known as a keystone species because of the adaptations that they make to their environment. Um, if you look in the top right hand corner, you'll see an arch. And this is where the, the phrase keystone species comes from. If you take the keystone out, the arch will collapse. And that's what happens to the, the ecosystem without these creatures in it. So on top of all of that, if that's not enough for you, we've also got um, Another thing that, that wetlands do is to help to stabilize the water flow within waterways. So um, it will slow the water down and spread it out. And so if you have heavier flash rain events, um, one of the enclosures uh, in Devon actually discovered that it, it took over an hour longer for the water to pass through the enclosure once beavers had adapted it than it did before. And so this is really slowing down the water and keeping it within the headwaters of that catchment rather than allowing it all to power down the channel as fast as possible. By dredging these channels, we've been creating more of a problem with that because we just encourage the water to go faster and faster towards the sea. And so that's when you have lots of problems um, with flooding and with erosion down the, the waterways as well. You're also helping to maintain flow within drought periods and so it's stored up in the headwater areas and that helps in turn to create stable temperatures and a, a stable water temperatures and a sort of more permanent uh, water flow throughout the year which is again good for lots of species. So it's also found um, that wetlands will filter nutrients and again, within this study that they did in the enclosure, um, they determined that more phosphate will settle um, and sediment will settle within the enclosure as the water's going more slowly. The nitrates will be let off through denitrification and carbon will be sto uh, stored within those soils. And so um, you are in turn filtering these nutrients naturally out of the waterways. So as climate becomes less stable, this is all going to be all the more important um, because more resilience will be needed within our systems to counteract that. Also, the increasing human population, we're using more and more water. And so um, that will play a factor too and uh, will be all the more reason why we need more resilience. So as we said, uh, carbon stored, and it's locked into the wet soils. And so this is really good for, for climate too, um, because we're looking at ways which we can sequest uh, carbon into the ground. This is three to five times more effective than forests. And so um, it's important that we look at different situations, different solutions um, 
for different places. So you may be looking at planting trees or encouraging wetlands um, or allowing soils to be in better condition. All of these different strategies can help with the climate. So um, beavers can really play their part in our fight against climate change as well. So at the moment, we're spending money on artificially resolving these problems um, for flooding, water treatment, or even river restoration. But beavers not only will help us to restore these, but they'll maintain them for us free of charge as well. So um, have our little engineer help us. There's also um, the benefits to people health-wise. So um, there's been quite a lot of studies and well documented that spending time in nature can be very good for people. Um, there's even green prescriptions now. And so bringing back a charismatic species like a beaver can be a, a good way of encouraging some new people to get out and in, enjoy the environment. And with that comes potentially ecotourism opportunities. So that's a, a bunch of reasons why beavers and, and wetlands are good. I'm gonna quickly cover some of the reasons why you can find conflict between people and beavers and uh, what you can do about those. So when we're talking about conflicts, it's important to remember that um, beavers don't travel too far from the water. On average, around 20 meters um, from, from the water is where they'll go for food. And so these issues are not everywhere. They will be only in stretches where you find um, riparian strips and buffers, um, which allow a little bit of space between waterways and um, our land uses can be really effective in resolving all of the issues I'm about to mention. So there's four things that beavers do that people could potentially um, find annoying. Firstly, the damming that we talked about, um, whilst it's very beneficial in nature and in, um, incredibly helpful for all those other species, there can be situations where a dam can create localized flooding in places where you might not want it, whether that might be a productive field, um, a road, a property. For example, these are places where you wouldn't want that to occur. Feeding would be the second reason. Um, so beavers won't necessarily know whether the food was there naturally um, and is available to them or whether it was planted for production. And so they will help themselves to riparian crops as well. This does tend to be quite um, minimal and the costs incurred of this are incredibly small. They're quite tidy feeders um, and they don't take too much. So that's a slightly smaller one, but it can be an issue, especially in very productive parts of the landscape. And this is one of the reasons why in Scotland there has been more conflicts is because the um, unofficial reintroduction in the Tay started from a very, very productive um, area. And so there are more conflicts there for that reason. Excavating can be a third issue. So this is the burrowing. Um, again, very, very good in nature. But if you're driving your tractor a few over the land a few meters from the river and it falls in a hole, that can be an expensive and annoying problem for you. Also, if it's a flood bank, it would be undesirable to have burrows going through it. And so there are situations when you would not um, want that impact. And finally, tree felling. Um, tree felling is again very good in nature that would be a coppiced more dynamic system um, they're not killing all of these trees they are uh, creating new young growth and they will manage that sustainably because that's their food source so they want to um, make sure that there's still something available for them to eat however if you have a um nice tree at the end of your garden with a stream running through the bottom of it or if you have a cider orchard for example next to a river then you might be more concerned about um, the cutting of some of those trees. Finally um, an additional concern let me say about about beavers comes from the angling community and this is about migratory fish species and so 
there is a, a number of people who are worried that the beaver dams will prevent these fish species from swimming upstream and enabling them to breed. So one of the things I want to highlight about that, um, again, is that the beavers dams are not solid structures like human made weirs or, or dams um, that are made from concrete, for example. They have holes in them and the water will flow through, around and in higher water levels over the top of it. It's sometimes more difficult, however, if you're in an artificially contained stream, so the sides are um, co solid concrete, for example, then water getting around the edges can be more difficult. So there are exceptions to that rule. And within periods of low flow, if there's less rain, if it's a bit of a drought, if you've got a dam in one of those contained um, streams, then you can have some issues with that. So there are rare situations where that certainly can be the case and you would need to manage those situations. So you could lower those dams if necessary, put a notch in them or even use a, um, a fish pass, which is what you can see in the bottom of the screen at the moment. Um, dams can also be removed. So these are all management mitigating tools which should be potentially available um, to people with these concerns. The little video here from Devon as well of the fish jumping a dam in heavier flow to remind us that these migratory fish species co-evolved with beavers and learned to jump in order to navigate structures like this. So these are some of the management tools that we have available to us. Um, for feeding and felling, you have fences, um, whether these are electric fences or exclusion fences, um, very effective with beavers. They don't climb over these fences to get to things. Um, and as we said before, they don't stray too far from the water's edge. And so these are possibilities for farmers or um, individuals with crops or trees of concern. You can also wire trees individually or paint them with feeding deterrents to stop the, the beavers chewing on, on the bark there. If it's to do with water flow, you can lower dams, uh, you can remove dams, and a sustainable option is to put in a mechanism called a, a beaver deceiver or a flow device, um, which you can see here is essentially a pipe that goes through the dam and allows a certain level of water to remain, but not more than that. And so that's a good way of allowing beavers to stay, but for the situation not to get out of control. And that's been very popular um, in the States and mainland Europe uh, as a management tool for allowing beavers and people to coexist. So there's a hierarchy of options here. Um, all of these management tools need to be readily available to people. Um, tools such as relocating beavers, if you trap them, you can put them somewhere else. That is a very good option as well as a sort of later resort if your management isn't working. And finally, uh, lethal control can be used to, to manage populations um, as a last resort. In the future, when the country is to capacity and uh, we don't have wolves back in the country to um, eat and manage the population, there will be more of a need to um, use methods like lethal control to control numbers. But while the um, numbers are recovering, there is certainly um, no recommendation to do that because there's lots of places where we need to put them. And so that does need to be considered uh, a last resort at the moment. So obviously anyone who has um, any of these situations in their mind, if they're worried about how to manage them, then they'll be thinking who's going to, to do the work, who's going to pay for this, this management, um, what support's going to be available. And it was certainly feedback that we had from our local communities was that a mechanism of support was um, necessary in order to reintroduce this species. So we've been working hard to try to achieve that. Um, there are new schemes coming up within the government uh, such as ELMS, the Environmental Land Management Scheme, um, also other payment schemes. And we've been looking at local opportunities to help support landowners with uh, this potential management that we'll need to do as well. So this is an exciting update. Um, just in the last month, the 
English government have released a consultation and this is open until the 17th of November. So I do encourage everyone with something to say about this to, to provide your feedback. You can do that as an individual or as part of an organization and you can specify that at the beginning. So this is not about whether or if they should reintroduce beavers, but it's about how to do it and what considerations need to be taken um, into account in order to do it well. So the consultation covers um, a criteria for project approval, a management hierarchy, as we've just talked about, and approaches to both enclosed and wild populations going forward. So it's an amazing opportunity, really, because we've got all of the examples um, from Europe, from Scotland. We're almost the last country to the party to do this. So we've seen what works and what doesn't. And we can uh, take those management strategies on board and design something um, that works for us and uh, to make sure that we reimagine how land management is going to work um, at the same time, because these strategies and schemes for support are being written at the same time as the proposed um, management for beavers. And so it, it gives a really good opportunity to tie these things together. So the criteria covers um, a feasibility study to make sure that an area is going to be a suitable place for reintroduction, um, consideration of impacts that could be caused within that area and support um, in the way of a, a beaver officer who can be available to help you if you have any problems um, and the funding to cover both that role and and the impact management itself as well there's also a requirement to have community support um, and a steering group to be created from local stakeholders who will help to contribute to that so these are all things which the government are proposing um, should be available to a project in order for them to get a license to do a wild release of beavers going forward. So the result of this, um, it will close on the 17th of November, and then we'll expect an outcome towards the, the new year, probably. Um, so we're not quite sure of the timeline for that, but we hope by the end of the year, we might have some details about what the rules are going to be. So just to very quickly run through what we've done in Purbeck. Um, this has been something a long time in the making in Purbeck. This area that you're seeing on the map is essentially the area that I'm talking about when I say Purbeck. So this is the Purbeck Heaths NNR area. And this has been um, an evolving project for about 10 years with the introduction of Wild Purbeck. This is a group of organizations that manage various bits of these this land and they came together to co-manage a nature reserve so all of these organizations are working together to agree on the management strategy for this large area of land so that it can be managed for nature and so that's a uh, potentially unusual situation that we can take advantage of and it allows us to look at large scale reintroductions um, like the one that we're talking about. So there is a, a task group for our project made up of lots of organizations and um, that has been involving land managers, farmers, uh, NFU, CLA organizations like that. We also formed a Dorset wide um, steering group later, which would include other projects as well um, and some wider stakeholders that weren't found within our project area, but that had interests in the project. So we had um, the Exeter, University of Exeter um, experts come down and do some computer modeling, but also uh, to ground truth some of these as well. So these models were looking at where beaver habitats might be and therefore where we could potentially predict the impacts. I joined the team in 2019 and took um, a couple of years to talk to a lot of people to do the initial um, stakeholder feasibility consultation. So we spoke to lots of um, different individuals, whether they were landowners, uh, farmers, residents, and tried to make sure that we had a really good understanding of 
what people thought about the reintroduction of beavers, um, if there was any concerns, if there was any site specific things that we needed to look at in order to potentially manage these. And as I mentioned, there was a, um, a really positive feedback from our local community, but with that um, consideration that long-term support needed to be involved. So we finally um, proposed a phased project to make sure that we were going to do this gradually so that we could see how it goes and, and give ourselves sort of get out um, clauses just in case. And so we've started with a proposal for little c. And so this is a, a limited catchment, um, which is naturally enclosed by um, the habitat surrounding it so you have the salty uh, sea on one side and you have the dry heath on the other side and so it does to a certain extent um, geographically contain the beavers within this area it's also um, entirely managed for nature already and so there is uh, not a lot of concerns within that area so that's a safe place to start and then we aim to progress to the wider NNR area after that and finally um, a long way into the future, this will be part of the national scheme to, to reintroduce beavers on a wider scale. So we've done lots of preparation. Um, I've been looking at uh, maps of the land, going out and looking at the land uh, itself and any infrastructure uh, within it, water courses, uh, public access, things like that, to try to predict where impacts might occur. We also used the feedback we got from the community to look at uh, targeted site assessments for potentially vulnerable places um, where uh, impacts might occur. And we've mapped everything that we've found where there is essentially water and infrastructure and decided what can we do about this um, if an undesirable impact occurs, how much might that cost and can we cover that? So that's all been part of our planning for this potential project. Um, we've been looking at the local management strategies um, with our land uh, sort of committee of, of landowners and um, partners as well and the funding solutions locally and on a wider scale. So the communications has been ongoing that um, continues right the way from um, me joining the project up to date and that will continue in the future as well because it's really important that everyone in the local community knows what's going on and that they're able to uh, say something about it if they want to and, and to keep that learning process of understanding what beavers might do to um, our landscape. So we continue to work with partnerships and networks uh, in the area, and we're also building on our um, public engagement activities as well, starting to work now with schools. Um, I've been doing lots of public talks and we, we have regular updates going out to people who've been expressed an interest in receiving those. We also now have a web article which gives a bit of a summary of the process so far, which you're very welcome to keep an eye on for updates. We've fairly recently introduced some volunteer roles, um, so ways that you can help get uh, involved in the project if you would like to be more involved. Um, so firstly, Nature Champion Volunteers. Um, this is a sort of advocacy, uh, engagement and education team of volunteers. So at the moment, we're trying to design some educational uh, materials for schools, and uh, we will then start delivering some of that work later in the year or next year. Um, the ecology team are always busy in Purbeck and we have lots of volunteers already working on that and that will help to inform the beaver project looking at the uh, monitoring the impacts that beavers have on the environment as we go so there will be different groups uh, monitoring that and I've already started recruiting beaver manager volunteers as well although I can't uh, offer any work in this yet until we actually have beavers back in the landscape but um, it's good to be prepared so anyone who wants to walk around keeping an eye on some of these um, infrastructures and things that we've highlighted. Once beavers have arrived, then they can let us know if they see that something's happened and we can do something about it nice and efficiently. So there's lots of exciting ways that you can get involved. Um, if you don't have the time for that, but you'd still like to, to support the project, um, 
Beavers are going to need a lot of community support. Uh, firstly, the, the consultation. There will be um, very mixed responses to that. I think it's important that you have your say if you want to, regardless of your view. So if you have constructive um, feedback that you'd like to give or concerns that you have, you're welcome to, to put those in. Um, if you are supportive, please do fill it in as well, because we want to make sure that both views um, receive feedback on that. Um, there are ways to uh, show that you're supportive if you are. And so when it comes to us applying for a license for a project in Purbeck, we will need to show that the local community supports us. And so we would ask you to, to help us in that way. And the, the most simple thing you can do is to, to get the conversation going with people. So you may know someone that knows nothing about beavers. You can tell them what you've learned tonight and uh, you can get that conversation started, whether they're positive or, um, or more concerned, you can uh, start that conversation. You can get in touch if you have questions and, um, it's really good to, to do that in a non-judgmental way. If you have disagreements with each other, um, we all need to learn how to live alongside this species together. And so it's important that we try to make it work for everybody. So that's all I have to say for my talk. Um, I'd be very happy to answer any questions. Oh, thank you so much, Jen. That was an amazing talk. As a scientist, I loved all the data and really, uh, yeah, my brain is full of questions, actually. And um, the first one that I really want to kick off with is quite, I think it, it's quite an obvious one. But Brian asks, where will your beavers come from? So where are they being sourced? Are they being translocated from somewhere else? What's the story there? So at the moment, the uh, UK has a limit on um bringing animals from abroad. And so it needs to be animals from within the UK. So the, the most viable population for that is within Scotland at the moment. And as I mentioned, the, um, the River Tay has more conflicts because of the place that unfortunately the beavers started out in happens to be a more productive area due to the legislation in Scotland at the moment, um, whereby they're not allowed to translocate them to new areas. Um, they're allowed to spread naturally, but they're not allowed to move them to other areas. And so that has unfortunately resulted in more um, lethal control, but it also gives an opportunity for the projects within England to bring those animals down to England for, for the projects here. And so that's where most of the English beavers have been coming from recently. There may be changes to some of those policies within the next year or two. Um, we don't know yet, but so that might change. But at the moment, we would expect to get them from Scotland. So that would be a, a trapped, ideally pair of beavers. Um, they'd be trapped as a pair so that they can come down and start uh, their family here. Um, we can't obviously say we want beavers on Tuesday next week because we need to wait for a couple of beavers to be causing a problem for someone to say they need to be removed. And then at that moment, um, one of the experts such as uh, Roisin uh, will go up there, try to trap them and then help to bring them down to us. OK, but, uh, yeah, I mean, an another connected question to this from the same person, Brian. Actually, that's very related. So when you are looking, I mean, we looked at that map of Little C where you will, that's the first area of the, you know, I, I say translocation, but that would be the first area of the release. How large um, can an area like that, uh, how large is the population that that area can support? And um, how would they then disperse? You talked about the natural controls, didn't you, with the salt water on one side and then you've got the heath on the other. So in terms... I mean, I'm quite interested to know what is a kilometre square? How, how big is that area? How, how many beavers can that area support as a kind of kicking that off? Yeah, well, it's quite a technical question because, of course, it all depends on food availability. And so it differs everywhere that you do it. Um, at Little C, uh, I don't know how well you know it, but there's a, a large lake body, but then it's surrounded by huge um, areas of sallow car habitat, which is essentially wet woodland made of willow trees. And so it's got a huge amount of, of food available at Little Sea within that catchment there. So we predict that that's going to be more than sufficient for potentially if we reintroduce up to six beavers initially, um, that should keep them very happy for quite a number of years without any need to 
to go elsewhere. We haven't been able to put an exact number on that um, because it, it is quite a tricky calculation. But um, the experts predict that that's going to take quite some time for them to outgrow that space. What we do want to do um, is if we can start with the, the second area within the NNR at some point and do a few reintroductions there and start to build up a population there, what we predict the easiest uh, migration route out of the little sea catchment would be, would be to pop into Pool Harbour and as quickly as possible get back into a freshwater environment without spending too much time in the salt. And so actually that is the same location as we'd be looking at doing the second area of reintroductions. And so we're hoping that they will uh, be encouraged even more into that area because there's a population already there and then they can start to spread out within the NNR. So the hope is that they will start to recolonize the whole area on that basis obviously animals don't always follow the script no. so there is a possibility that some might decide they want to look somewhere else um, what we do in that scenario all depends a little bit on the status of beavers uh, within England and there is always the option to trap them and bring them back if necessary if okay. that's deemed um, a so I've, I've got two so I've, that's um, great thank there are you options there yeah, because I mean, a couple of questions just popped up, like, will the location be enclosed and how can they spread from the initial area? And then another one's come in um, from Jane. So that was from Roger. But Jane is asking, how will the beavers at Little Sea meet other beavers? And she's saying, will they swim out to sea like they do at Kent? So I'm thinking of like Mr. and Mrs. Beaver <laughs> from Norwich and Wardrobe, like swimming like that. But I mean, essentially, what the question is, is that the location is naturally enclosed because you've got that boundary between the, the heath and, and the sea. So how how can you just explain to us a little bit about how they're going to meet other communities? Yeah, so um, while it's sort of naturally contained a bit, it's more of a deterrent than an actual prevention. Right. Um, they're not going to be as keen to explore or the heath or the salt water as they would um, a, a more desirable habitat and so that will deter them while they've got enough um, habitat available and territories available within little sea they probably won't make the effort to, to do that you might get some adventurous ones that give it a go earlier on but it's less likely um, there won't be any fences we're looking at doing a um, an open release and so th that's why we need to wait for permission from the government for, for wild releases to be allowed and for all the local legislation to figure itself out um, before we do too much um, but what we expect is that when the little sea catchment reaches capacity and it becomes more desirable for them to find somewhere else is that they'll probably um, pop over the the end sort of down nearer the the um, ferry end of ferry road and pop into the Pool Harbour area there and then recolonize um, the the land south of the harbour which mm -hmm. is where we're looking at them being anyway and so okay. that's quite helpful and then yeah. if, if they go somewhere totally inappropriate we might have to trap them and bring them back okay okay if that people don't sense. want them there yeah if they do want them there they might be able to stay but... And the next two questions kind of moving into kind of anthropogenic impacts, really. The first, I mean, they're both related, actually, because they're both related to um, one is related to nitrogen pollution and the other one is related to carbon release. So Peter is asking, um, based on some information he got from Wessex Water, that where you have runoff coming from quite deep water that contains historic levels of quite high nitrogen, so for example, from fertilizers, and um, he's asking, you know, where you have beavers that are perhaps, you know, creating those dams or, or digging through channels and, and creating that runoff coming from kind of old water systems, releasing the nitrogen back into the water courses, causing eutrophication. Is that is that is that a concern of yours or, or can you tell us a little bit more about that environmental it's impact? Yeah, it's not something that has been highlighted. Again, as I said at the beginning, I, I work with lots of scientists and experts on this, and so I'm not necessarily an expert in nitrates myself. Um, but it's not something that's um, come up with regards to that. I mean, when beavers burrow and, and create dams and things, they're not, you know, digging down a, a huge distance. It, it's just enough to create that sort of 
of 70 centimetres of, of water. So they're not burrowing into the ground uh, to any great depth. And so I think that's probably why it's not considered a big risk. I know there have been some papers about the release of phosphates from soils and things like that in relation to um, a, a dam breach during heavy rain, for example. Mm. And so that is something that some of the partners have been looking at, um, what the expected impacts of that could be. Um, it's a sort of roundabout topic. It's not, again, my specialty, but um, if, if you're uh, collecting a lot, of, um, a lot of these sediments and doing, uh, having lots of benefits in that respect, mm -hmm. that can be very good. In some instances, you might release some of those, um, which might be considered less good. And so it's a sort of circular topic, which I would probably defer to my hydrology experts from Exeter University, to be honest. <laughs> And related to that, actually, which I think is quite an interesting question leading up to COP26 is, Jane asks, when beavers dig canals and burrows, do they release carbon? And do you know anything about their contribution to the carbon balance? I find that quite interesting. Well, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, similarly, the, the benefits of restoring the wetlands would be so much greater than anything you would be releasing. Um, because you're storing so much carbon as a result of restoring these wetlands. Yes. I, I just think that would outweigh any yeah. Um, yeah. sort of negative impacts in that argument. Yeah. So I think, I think it would very much be a positive. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, really we need to address coal-fired power stations more than we need to address <laughs> beavers digging into. Sorry, that's very controversial. Um, moving on from that, I, th I think there are two related questions as well. Um, Obviously, uh, we had Birds of Pool Harbour on a couple of months ago, and we were talking about the Osprey release uh, kind of program they were running in Purbeck, and that location was, you know, kept incredibly secret. Are you concerned that where you're publicising the release of the beavers within the Little Sea area, that that is going to contribute to their persecution? And this is a question brought up by Penny. And I, th I think that's really interesting because where we are sensing that there's quite a strong debate and there's quite strong opinions about beavers, is that something of concern to the National Trust and the partners involved? It's um, not particularly. I think our aims with, with the Little Sea site is to have some positive engagement with with people and to use it as um, an, a very open situation for education because there's a lot of misconceptions about beavers there's lots of myth busting that needs to be done um, not necessarily seeing beavers themselves I mean being nocturnal they are more difficult to potentially see than some other species but there there might be the possibility of, of seeing them at, at little sea uh, and it's an ideal spot for that because you haven't got the negative, um, you haven't got any sort of conflicts going on there. So you can have them there as a positive educational experience without hopefully anyone being too angry about their presence. Um, and so I think that will be very beneficial in the long run to, to help build on the awareness of what these animals actually do. I mean, you also won't see a huge amount of um, you know they're not going to dam the lake and so you won't see a huge amount of, of negatives uh, you'll just see a lot of um, positive nature impacts um, there and so it is something we we plan to to do in a, as responsible way as possible obviously we don't want crowds of people watching the beavers at one time either but we plan to do some remote monitoring and to help um, share that with people and so there will be places within the wider landscape that we certainly don't want the public to be going to try to find them um, but we hope with a large enough landscape like the one that we're talking about there will be places where it might be good for ecotourism and good for education for people mm -hmm. to be able to see them but places where they have their privacy as well. Great and that leads me on nicely to the last question here which is very upbeat it's from Emily Stevens she emailed you about volunteering and linking it Hi, to Emily. her dissertation <laughs> yes. which is really nice um, and, but kind of just extending that slightly we have lots of people in the audience they some of them might be interested in those different strands of community engagement that you listed how do they find out more about how they become a citizen science just send me contributing? A, yeah just send me an email um and i will send you all the information about how you okay. can get involved so if you would like to share my email address um then i'm very open to 
talking to people or to sending more information about those. Um, they are evolving roles um, as we sort of get up and running. And once the, especially the advocacy side um, gets some legs and, and starts to uh, get going, it, it can, you know, be a, a self rolling thing within the community mm -hmm. and people can teach each other. And that's essentially where we want to get to. So the more the merrier. Yeah, and I think your email is jen.christford at nationaltrust.org.uk. That That's correct? correct, yes. Yeah, God, what a memory. I remember that <laughs> off your slide. <laughs> Thank you ever so much, Jen. It has Thank been you. a really fantastic, brilliant talk. Loads of science. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, and I, yeah, I just, I've come away really understanding i mean really good presentation of the debate there that that is really what I came away from from your from your presentation was was the, how you presented very well the the you know the different sides of people's feelings about this issue it's done very very well thank you very much jen thank, thank you, you every much. thank you thank you everybody in the audience for coming along um of course you can go to wessex museums um I can't even remember our website because I haven't got my, my blurb up. But do go to our website, Wessex Museums, um, to find out more about how you can support our museum through a donation. We thank Strategic Solutions who have supported all of the talks. Uh, we are so grateful for that. Um, and this brings to a close, rather sadly, our Wildlife in the Red series. You can, of course, go to our website to have a look at um, some of the collections that have inspired this huge digital engagement program, um, which started during COVID-19 lockdown last year. But it ha it's been my absolute pleasure to host Jen from the National Trust talking about this brilliant project. Thank you, Jen, so much. And I would like to wish you all a very good evening. Good night.